Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Duncan Allen. Um, I'm an associate fellow on the Russia Eurasia programme at Chatham House in London. Um, delighted to see so many people um, taking part in today's event, which covers a, a whole series of really important analytical and policy issues um, that are well worth deliber deliberating today and are, and are almost certainly going to cause us to think hard for a long time to come. Um, we're looking at the issue of Black Sea security, but particularly the issue of Black Sea security through the lens of um, some of the implications that really flow from Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 and Russia's subsequent significant militarization of Crimea and the general, more general militarization of Russia's presence in the Black Sea region. What does this mean? Where is it going? And what are the policy implications, both for Ukraine and for um, the countries of the Black Sea region itself and more widely? So there's plenty to discuss today, and I'm, I, for one, am really looking forward to this discussion. Now, we have two speakers with us today. Unfortunately, one of our speakers um, was forced to um, drop out for, for private reasons, but we still have two really first-class speakers um, to help guide us through this wide range of issues before us. First of all, we have Alina Frolova, who is the deputy chair of the Center for Defense Strategy in Kiev. Um, but between 2019 and 2020, Alina was deputy defense minister of Ukraine. So really provides both a, an analytical and a policy perspective to this set of issues, which I think is gonna be really invaluable for us. So Alina, welcome today. We also have Stephen Blank. Stephen is senior fellow at the Eurasia Programme at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Washington. And as I'm sure many of you will know, is a prolific, a truly prolific writer and commentator about a whole range of regional security issues. So Stephen, welcome to you too. I'm happy to be here, Duncan. Um, before we start, let me quickly go through a few housekeeping rules. The first point to mention is that this event is on the record. It's on the record. That means it is being recorded. The recording will be made available a bit later on via the Chatham House website. So this meeting is on the record to repeat. Um, each of our speakers will then speak for up to 15 minutes each, um, followed by which we will then have a, a discussion period. Um, now you, you can take part in the discussion in, in one of two ways. You can either use the chat function on your Zoom screen to post comments and questions, which I will then monitor as moderator, or you can raise your electronic hand um, again on your Zoom screen in order to ask a question live. The choice is entirely up to yours. Um, but we here at Chatham House would certainly encourage people to take part as actively as possible so that we all benefit from, from, a, from an interactive conversation. I think that's all from me. So without further delay, let me pass the floor to Alina. Alina, please, we'd be very interested to hear a Ukrainian perspective on some of the issues. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm really, really glad that finally um, the Black Sea security is the topic for many discussions these days. Um, because when we, um, when I was just like a deputy minister in 2019, when we came in the ministry and just like make a first approach to security situation, overall security situation, we understood that for Ukraine, the weakest point is the uh, legacy security. But the interesting stuff was that it was not only the issue for Ukraine. I mean that, yeah, territorially we can say that um, Georgia, Ukraine, Romania probably will suffer from uh, insecurity. But uh, this region has huge influence on the whole, uh, like a wider, broader security situation in the world uh, and implicating on the interests of the main players. At the same time, the attention to this region is quite low, was quite low. Um, the attention from everyone, from NATO, from key partners, from 
um, like uh, even Black Sea countries were not very cooperative on some kind of security issues. And main uh, point was that this is the um, topic for Ukraine and Crimea was out of radars on, uh, on negotiations on deoccupation and so on. So that like it took a little bit of time. I remember when I made the first presentation, it was probably beginning of um, end of uh, 2019 in NATO with all the maps and all the description of the uh, militarization of Crimea. How does it influence on situation? How does it cover the European continent? Uh, most of countries, uh, well, I was quite surprised, but most of countries didn't know this information and didn't take it into account, into account while taking a decision. Um, the last escalation uh, made by Russians, they, 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 it pays attention a lot to the security situation at all, plus the already one year of work over the topic of uh, Crimea occupation and the Black Sea security, it started to rise the profile. Uh, Crimean platform, which is the initiative of the Ukrainian government, specifically Ministry for Foreign Affairs, as the platform for discussion of the occupation issues, uh, which was raised up this like lately. So it also pays a lot of attention or brought a lot of attention to the region. Um, why it's so important and why we should think about it and why we should take care about it and not only Ukraine. So the um, last escalation, yes. Yeah? So the, the, the main questions which I started to receive from foreign media or foreign colleagues uh, when the escalation started, so what are the goals and will it transfer into the war? Uh, it was like, a, you know, for me, a very strange position because we have war already for seven years and this is like a daily um, stuff uh, for us already, unfortunately. And uh, the, we faced it every day. Yes, we have sometimes escalation, sometimes the escalation, but principally changed nothing. So because um, we see uh, no change in strategy or policy of Russia or no change in intentions of Russia. Therefore, the uh, war which we have in Ukraine, whatever, in Donbass or um, uh, Crimea or Black Sea, it's just the component of the uh, global policy which Russia is producing. The main goals are to put the chaotic uh, relations uh, or to make a chaos in international relations, to misuse the international law, to find more and more gaps in, in international law, maritime law or, or any other, to use it for their like uh, turn and um, to um, fight with the main powers in the world, not on the scene of economy or competition, but um, uh, on the scene of chaotic decisions, which limit uh, any strategy to be developed. The last escalation actually leads to the quite big increasing of forces on the borders with Ukraine and quite big of, uh, for increase of forces in Crimea. Uh, it also led to the situation when we have increasing of forces in Belarus, uh, and uh, uh, nevertheless, so the Russia now uh, announced that they will like a take off uh, partially uh, military component from the borders, but that's not true actually because we see that there is no movement of heavy, heavy weapons uh, vehicles. So maybe some troops are relocated, but it gives the possibility like in few hours to bring them back. Uh, plus all the equipment which was brought to Crimea, it uh, uh, still stays there and there is no movement. All the equipment and troops which put in uh, Belarus are still there and there is no movement. Uh, and we know that there is like a declined, uh, declared um, exercises which they should keep in September and which actually is uh, part of all these preparations. We have um, a declaration like a few days ago uh, from Russian Duma that they will increase a, a number of units on the border, like in constant, uh, um, in constant manner on the border with Ukraine because of the very aggressive actions of NATO. So that means that they like a 
declaring that they won't change uh, principally a situation with the militarization on, in, in this line. And frankly saying there is nothing new here because um, uh, our center, which I represent now and which we established like a think tank for defense uh, strategies one year ago, the first um, research which we made, it was like about a Black Sea security um, uh, region. Uh, so uh, it was like uh, about the possible scenarios of uh, what could happen in the nearest future in the Black Sea. And actually one of these scenarios we see in implementation now. So this was situation which principally was known to, let's say, um, specialists in security and military component, not only in Ukraine, because we much wider speak about this, like a talk uh, had a lot of discussions with our counterparts. Nothing new, we cannot prognose the exact time, but we actually knew that it will happen. Plus uh, seeing the uh, program of transformation of Russian armed forces, we perfectly understand that they will be completely ready for big, uh, like a full scale aggression in uh, next year. And um, uh, so th this is the like a full transformation process which, which was made and it should be completed next year. Uh, we also know that uh, this summer we can expect uh, another escalations because we will have a summit, inauguration summit of the Crimean platform, which like uh, makes Russian crazy because they don't want even to um, start discussion about the Crimea future. Uh, they consider this issue is closed for them. Uh, it, this is like quite different from Donbass uh, from the point of view that they do not recognize even the possibility of such negotiations. So uh, like uh, they try to talk to Erdogan and to put some threats uh, if the Turkey will jump into the Crimean platform. I know that they talk also to some other leaders uh, trying to hold them from joining. Uh, the Crimean platform. So in August, we will have here this like a summit and it will obviously cause um, some kind of uh, reaction from Russians. Plus, uh, do not forget that we have elections in Russia and it always, always their elections are uh, going with, uh, you know, some identifying of some enemy, um, escalating some conflicts. So to create this push for the power, like to, to increase the rating and support. So this is the like a short description of what's going on. We have some kind of predictable actions. Uh, we have some kind of planned escalation, but at the same time, this planned escalation was quite um, quite surprising for Western countries, uh, which is like, a, of course, the problem of Ukraine because we cannot deliver like a mess our message well. The second is a problem for uh, Western democracies because it means that they have no long lasting plan. From one point of view, we should say that the reaction was much faster than in previous uh, circles. Uh, but again, coming back to strategy, uh, still no NATO, no key partners has some kind of long term and uh, um, clear strategy of how do, will they react or how they will deter the aggressive actions of Russians. And again, this is not uh, only actions against Ukraine. This uh, escalation had like a multiple um, messages and goals and one of the goals was like influence on uh, newly elected uh, administration of US. It was an, uh, like a also message to EU. So it was like quite complex approach to the issue. And um, this is the problem, not only Ukraine and uh, uh, the, the, because the Russia can reach from Crimea with its missiles, all the uh, European states. Uh, Russia do not allow, for example, Romania to make a normal uh, gas extractions in their uh, Black Sea territory. Oh, I, I do not say even about Ukrainian uh, territories. Yes, so Russia stops the normal trading uh, and uh, brings a lot of threats to maritime security, not only in this region. They use the Crimea as the 
uh, center for deploying the troops to Syria and some other regions. They have the access, common exercises with Egypt. They train in on their exercises uh, how they will they behave or, uh, on Baltics. So we see uh, all these like a science uh, which uh, shows that this is just the base for um, projecting the power. And um, uh, I will be happy to listen for um, analytics opinion about how we can, what steps else can be made to um, like a create, to establish this strategy, to establish the strategy, how to deter, how to prevent more than how to react on the actions and how to make uh, the world more stable and maybe reinvent some of the approaches to uh, stabilize the regional security and stabilize the wider security in the region. Thank you. That's it for intro. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Alina. And that was a fantastic intro, if I might say so, because you, you've opened up many important issues that I think we're going to want to investigate in, in greater detail um, this afternoon. Um, I have a couple of questions myself, if I may. Um, first of all, I would be very interested to know um, what in your judgment or how, how much further in your judgment you think that Russia's militarization of its presence in Crimea is yet to go. I mean, how much further could Russia go with this? You mentioned earlier that Russia is modernizing its, its military capabilities more widely. Um, what could we yet see in Crimea in the region? And I think the, related to that, um, I think this, this also relates to the point that you made about the um, significant escalation of, of Russian military force and pressure in Crimea and the Donbass earlier this year. Um, when we think about Russia's military presence in particular in Crimea, um, how serious a risk um, is the use of military force by Russia? So, in other words, in what plausible circumstances might military force actually be used by Russia, in your estimation? Could you maybe give a few thoughts on those questions? Mm -hmm. Well, how much further? I think that actually, you know, uh, some kind of um, some actions which Russia do in Crimea has no sense from the military point. For example, they put a lot of tanks in Crimea. Well, what you can do with tanks in Crimea? I mean, that uh, that's obviously that the, uh, this small uh, pass to the continental Ukraine won't let to use them. And uh, part of these tanks, for example, are quite old uh, machinery, but still they're there. And this is demonstration, more demonstration than uh, the like a uh, practical use. At the same time, uh, we, uh, let's say we don't have 100% proofs, but 99% that the nuclear weapon is already there because they uh, restore all the storage places of the nuclear weapon. They have some kind of uh, presence of the forces which support the nuclear weapon. They deliver there some kind of goods which need to uh, serve um, this, so we um, expect that it's already there. And um, well, with uh, nuclear forces there, you don't need so much escalation, I would say further militarization. Uh, the number of troops actually, which is there, it's like increasing uh, many uh, armies of many European countries. I mean, that a lot of, most of them. <laughs> And uh, plus the number of ships and vessels which they use, it's like increase on some positions in uh, 20 times. So before all these uh, events started in 2013, uh, Russia was not like uh, even close to Turkey in regard to the uh, maritime power. We have the exact figures. I will just like rise up them and uh, show you. But for now on, and they have plans uh, for the next few years, so they will increase on some capacities three times. Some capacities already increased 10 times. So the actual militarization is on the top already. They do not need more. Uh, for something, even for demonstration. It's like a huge military base. And most of the like life uh, of the Crimea is dedicated to it. For example, the 
uh, approved special act uh, which said that the private uh, oil station and gas stations should keep some kind of reserve for in Crimea for uh, uh, use of the military or uh, authorities. So that's some that's uh, part of preparation, let's say so. Uh, will they use uh, military force? Well, uh, let's say so that um, they have few goals there. Deterrence first, yes, so which they do the best. No one wants to be present in the Black Sea. The uh, uh, trade routes are changed. Uh, they, they, we see that uh, the uh, most of the countries, they started, NATO countries started to increase now presence in the Black Sea compared to 2013 but it still even didn't reach that times. So um, uh, the, the, the times which was before, for example, in 2008, when the aggression in Georgia started. So it was like a maximum of the presence. Uh, and uh, so they like a deter everybody from the Black Sea and Azov Sea region as always like, a, let's say it's fully occupied almost by Russians. So they control uh, fully. The second, they influence the Ukrainian trade and economical situation. So like a trying to weaken us. So that, that's like a, also the reachable point. Uh, and uh, the third day is still in the gas, which they like are selling to Europe uh, from Crimea, uh, from Ukrainian territories and do not allow us to develop this like a gas shell. Uh, so can they use the military forces? Yes, we do expect that they can. Uh, we have like a seven scenarios of how they can do this. Uh, most of scenarios are about the amphibious operations or some kind of special operations. Some of them can be done to uh, clean the supply of the water to Crimea. So it can be like a special operation forces which will uh, deal with the water sources. They can also use the special operations in the rivers like Dnieper and Danube because it's quite easily to, to, they can quite easily to get there. So it can be some kind of terroristic acts or uh, like a mine blowing which happened, uh, but still it's the military forces which can be used. Do we expect like a massive, uh, I don't know, open uh, military force deployment in, into Ukrainian territory? No, not now, let's say. But we do expect some kind of these dedicated operations or provocations which can be made against the uh, Ukrainian forces or uh, uh, NATO or partner forces present. Well, thank you again, Alina. Um... A sobering picture. Um, Stephen, um, in, in terms of addressing this sobering picture, uh, one comment that I noted Alina made was that, in her opinion, she didn't see much of a strategy from uh, the West, from NATO, from the leading Western powers. Um, I wonder if you could um, set out a few of your thoughts about what you think a viable strategy would look like um, in terms of dealing with some of these challenges. And I'd be particularly interested to hear about what you think um, Western objectives should be in, in, in terms of a strategic approach. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very, glad, <clears throat> I'm very glad to be here. And I'd like to thank Chatham House for the invitation. Uh, and also because our Turkish speaker had to leave uh, in, a, in an emergency, I will also address the role of Turkey in this strategy. Uh, so. First of all, I think, Duncan, your question got the priorities wrong, if, you, if I may say so, because the first thing the West needs to agree on are what are its objectives. And only then can there be a, a unified Western strategy. And a unified Western strategy is more than simply aggregating together American, British, French, German, etc. But it also means bringing to bear the real power of European security organizations like NATO, the European Union, and other regional or sub-regional organizations. Uh, my thoughts about a strategy, for example, I have a place for the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, there are other examples of European organizations that people could easily conceive of here. So the strategy should be 
to preserve the European order that was reached with Russian consent in a series of treaties that ended the Cold War 30 years ago. And what's more, that those treaties also guaranteed a few principles that need to be upheld. The indivisibility of security in Europe, the end of the Soviet Union, both de facto and de jure, the end of the Warsaw Pact and the freedom of the erstwhile members of the so-called Soviet bloc to choose with whom or with anybody they want to go or if they want to be alone or neutral in, in New Europe. So those liberal principles, what we call the uh, rule of order system, if you like, uh, needs to be defended. That's a fundamental goal. Within that framework, that means also defending the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the new states that emerged out of the post-Soviet environment, the biggest one being Ukraine. And furthermore, dealing with uh, contemporary security challenges. And this is where we can start to formulate a strategy. If you look at the entire Black Sea, not just Russia and Ukraine, but the entire littoral of the Black Sea, and if you want to talk about the Black Sea Basin and go further afield into the Balkans and the Caucasus, you see that security is multidimensional. It is not just a question of armies. It's not hard security. The security defects in many of the new states that have emerged after 1991 or that freed themselves from the Soviet yoke indicates the difficulties that what we might call post-Leninist states have in making a transition to good governance, not just to democracy, but to good governance, which may even precede democracy as such. And what we see in many of these places is what a former colleague of mine, Max Manwaring, who used to work at the Army War College in the United States, called illegitimate governance. He was talking about Latin America, but we see the same phenomenon here. And what is illegitimate governance? It is corruption, corrosive foreign capital that comes in without checks, that undermines checks and balances and institutions in the host country, and is used to subvert governments and the public interest for private and for foreign gain. Shady energy deals play a prominent role in Eastern Europe, in the Black Sea Basin about that. Suborned media is another example, and we've seen that all over the place in Ukraine as well. We see corrupted and subverted political parties, parties who are receiving subsidies from abroad, and we're never sure, quite sure who's actually paying these subsidies and for what purpose. The incitement of ethno-religious tensions, or what Henry Adams called the systematic organization of hatred, and the whipping up of identity politics, all in order to fragment states. This was even true for the former Yugoslavia, and it's going on in the Western Balkans as well, not just in the Eastern Balkans, which are littoral states. These trends facilitate the fragmentation of states from within, and, and render them vulnerable to foreign intervention. Ukraine is by no means the only state where we've seen this. We've seen this in Moldova. We see it in Georgia. We have seen uh, now in Azerbaijan and Armenia in Nagorno Karabakh, not just one foreign intervention, but Turkey as well in the last war. And weaknesses that invite civil or foreign strife. So the strategy has to aim not just at deterring Russia and enabling Ukraine to defend itself, but at strengthening good governance, sound institutions, rule of law throughout Europe. Because the whole project of the post-Cold War Europe is the integration of a Europe whole and free as George H.W. Bush said, and as has been endorsed by European governments repeatedly, and presumably will be endorsed again 
at the various meetings that are going to take place this week in, in Europe, G7, NATO Council, uh, NATO, and so on. Russia's fundamental geopolitical objective is to break what the, uh, the to use the French word, the finalité, the finality of European integration, because a democratic Europe that is integrated along democratic lines, and particularly a democratic Ukraine, is the gravest threat imaginable to Putin and his system, which, to be blunt, is a criminal system that relies on predation, corruption, and intimidation, and cannot easily coexist. It can coexist, but not easily, and is always under it feels itself under pressure from democratic governments in this part of the world. So the strategy, as I have said, needs to be a US, NATO, EU, regional and sub-regional organizations, military, economic, political, diplomatic, media. And the objective for Ukraine, as you asked, is therefore strengthening Ukraine, restoring its territorial integrity, preserving it as a democratic, independent state that can choose its friends and allies as it sees fit, and which is not threatened by Russia because it wants to be a democracy. Now, that's the, uh, those are the grand objectives. The, within that, there are certain fundamental precepts that have to be followed. Uh, and the, this is where I can start talking a bit about Turkey. No Black Sea strategy in any dimension is conceivable without the support of Turkey. And in the last 15 to 17 years or so, since the EU-Turkish negotiations broke down, we have seen Turkey break with the EU and follow its own path. Uh, its political system has devolved once again into one-man authoritarianism. There is a definite uh, vision here uh, of Turkey as a regional great power from the Balkans to North Africa to the Caucasus and the Middle East, which has led many to talk about neo-Ottomanism in Turkish foreign policy. That particular trend may or, not, may or may not be the case. Others see a version of Turkish Eurasianism, which is distinct from Russian Eurasianism here, but Turkey is a member of NATO. It is a very steadfast friend of Ukraine. It is now selling Ukraine military technology and weapon systems that have uh, aroused the anger of the Russian government. Last week, Lavrov actually threatened Turkey, which tells you that the relationship between Moscow and Ankara is perhaps more fraught than uh, people have thought. And that op also opens up opportunities for the West to restore a dialogue with Turkey on military security in the Black Sea, support for Ukraine, finding a solution to energy in Europe, to energy demand and issues in Europe that would reduce Russia's leverage over Black Sea states and Central and Eastern Europe and keep uh, those states freer and more integrated to a Western economy. With that happening as well, we would be able to reduce the scope for Russian political warfare, with corruption of media, so subordination of political parties, espionage, and so on. Of course, the fact of the matter is that the Russian threat is not only in Ukraine. Just to give one example, two examples, Bulgaria, a state that gets overlooked for various reasons. Some 13 years ago, I believe, the uh, Russian ambassador to the EU, uh, Vladimir Chizhov, stated that uh, Bulgaria was Russia's Trojan horse in the EU. To some degree, that may still be the case. For example, the Russians are building Turk Stream pipeline, which is the southern analog to the Nord Stream pipeline that has gotten much more publicity. Turk Stream is supposed to bring gas from Russia and perhaps as well from occupied Ukraine to Turkey. And from Turkey, it, then it's supposed to go through a series of pipelines and interconnectors into the Balkans and then further north. 
Now, because of the sanctions, the pipeline from Turkey to Bulgaria, Turk, uh, Turk Stream 2, is, can, supposedly cannot be built by Russia because no money is coming in. The fact of the matter is that the Bulgarian government, and I've written about this, has allowed Russia to be the uh, principal funding uh, support for this. The contractors are chosen by Russia. And in effect, Turk Stream 2 is a Russian pipeline, and there is massive corruption of Bulgaria in order to get this. In another case, last week, Bulgaria was supposed to send a list of Russian spies to, I believe it was Interpol, or to a, a European Union uh, branch, and they sent all the wrong names, uh, not by accident. So we see that Bulgaria has serious problems. Bulgarian media is heavily influenced by Russia. Hungary, we know about, is also a very pro-Russian state. And the Russians are deep, extremely active in Serbia as well. So this is not just the Black Sea, it spreads into the Balkans. But a strategy that can strengthen Ukraine, bring Turkey back into a reasonable dialogue with its allies, and actually create a, a basis for a stronger EU dialogue with Turkey, for example, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, would open up opportunities to reduce Russia's leverage here. With regard to Ukraine as well, it is not just a question of strengthening Ukrainian defense capabilities, clearing out the Soviet cobwebs, so to speak, in the Ukraine, strengthening its land forces and naval forces. These are particularly important. They get overlooked, but they are of vital significance. Getting the Straits of uh, the Kerch Straits and the Sea of Azov opened up in violation of, uh, against the Russian violation of their uh, freedom. It's also a question of strengthening Ukrainian governance, uh, overcoming oligarchs, people like Medvedchuk, who is now finally being dealt with. And also, for example, reforming the Ukrainian energy system. The fact of the matter is, and this again may not be well known, if Ukraine was able to carry out a sound energy policy, it has the means not only of supplying all of its own energy needs, but of exporting gas to Europe as well, through the pipelines that already are in existence or by building new pipelines. Therefore, the energy strategy, and here's where the Three Seas Initiative comes in as well, needs to contemplate not just getting Ukraine reformed, but actually building interconnectors north-south from the Baltic to the Black Sea with support from the United States and EU, and that's part of the Three Seas Initiative mandate, in order that gas can flow freely to and flow from Ukraine, but also from other sources where Russia does not have leverage, Caspian, Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, United States, uh, Norway, and so on. Those kinds of de uh, developments, a robust conventional strategy to gain escalation uh, the dominance in, in the Balkans and Black Sea so that Russia cannot threaten. By that, I mean not that we can threaten to attack Russia, but that Russia cannot carry out offensives in the Black Sea uh, easily and get and have present everybody with a fait accompli. Thus, its ability to threaten Europe at the conventional level and then afterwards at the nuclear level is severely reduced, even if Russian security is not threatened. This is part of the military response that needs to be there, building up the Ukrainian army, reforming Ukrainian governance, and coming together with an energy plan for northern and uh, uh, for, excuse me, southeastern Europe, the Balkans, Black Sea area, that brings together the Caspian, Eastern Mediterranean, and other sources. And that includes Turkey in order to reduce Russian leverage. Furthermore, we need to see a much stronger Western influence in the Caucasus on the other side of the Black Sea. The United States and the EU were virtually excluded from Nagorno-Karabakh. There are a couple of signs in recent days that maybe the United States has regained interest in the Caucasus. This is going to be admittedly a heavy lift, but if you are going to carry out a Black Sea strategy, it has to be transregional. That means it's not only the Balkans, it's not only Ukraine or the Eastern Mediterranean, it's also the Caucasus, and it has to be uh, multidimensional, as we have said here. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much indeed, Stephen. And I think rather like Alina, you, you've opened up an array of issues here, which I think are going to be worthy of further examination in the, in the time we've got left. Um, I'll, just, I'll just come back to you with one specific question, if I may. And I'm also going to um, pass a question that I've received from John Roberts. Um, my, my question first, um, what you've sketched out are some very big picture issues. We're talking about regional governance. You're talking about military deterrence. As you, as you say, security in the Black Sea region should be viewed multidimensionally. Uh, if we're going to think about this in strategic terms, that all makes sense. You, you've also talked about um, member states of the EU and NATO being involved. The, um, so so it's also, there are also a lot of moving parts in terms of actors. Now, marrying all this together, it seems to me, really is going to take a great deal of, of concentrated leadership, not least from the, from the US and the Biden administration. I just wonder... My question is, I just wonder how much of a priority this is going to be for a Biden administration, given the welter of issues on its foreign policy agenda. And also, just very quickly, the question from, from John Roberts, you mentioned that one of the West's goals should be the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Does that include the return of Crimea and those parts of the Donbass occupied by Russian-backed separatists? And if so, then how? Okay, so we have two questions here. Uh, to be frank, John, I'm, I'm pessimistic about the ability of the United States and Europe to carry out this strategy. It's not just a question of the Biden administration. I don't see any European leadership. I mean, unfortunately, when we talk about Europe, Bismarck's point is correct. And as he said, point d'Europe, notion géographique. Europe is just simply a geographical notion. French, German, and British, and uh, the Italian, and Polish policies do not point in a uniform direction. There is, to be frank, a lack of leadership across Europe. Uh, I'm not saying something any, out of school here. I think this is well known. Uh, I think the quality of, of your leadership in Europe uh, uh, needs to be improved. Uh, the recent uh, visit of uh, EU Foreign Minister Borrell to Lavrov in Russia uh, provides an example of what I'm saying. So. I'm laying out a strategy. I want it to be uh, uh, implemented. I'm pushing for that in my writings and speeches or events like this. But uh, in, in, as a, an, anal an analyst who has to work with the realities, I'm skeptical. Now, as far as John Roberts' question goes, yes, territorial integrity means the return of the Donbass and of Crimea. Question is how? Well, it's not going to happen by war. But the point is strengthening Ukraine so that any Russian military pressure is unavailing brings us to a point where the costs to Russia of occupying these areas becomes too great to bear. Now, that's going to be a very difficult point because uh, particularly with Crimea, it's very difficult to see how Mr. Putin can one day turn around and say, you know, people, we made a terrible mistake. Is not, Crimea is not ours. Uh, that would be the end of his regime. But uh, he will not be there forever. And we have to be alert to situations and, and opportunities that uh, would allow us to put the pressure on Russia by strengthening Ukraine, both internally and militarily, so that the impossibility of holding on to Crimea and Donbass becomes all too glaring, given the fact that structural stagnation in the Russian economy is well advanced and maybe even more advanced than uh, we know. Uh, they have major problems, as uh, Richard Wright has written in the chat, supplying water to Crimea. This can be a point of leverage as well. But it's not going to happen until there is a unified program in Ukraine and among its friends to strengthen Ukraine across these dimensions that we have talked about here. Uh, so the Ukrainians have to do a good deal of heavy lifting and Europe and the United States as well. Uh, otherwise, uh, the status quo will just simply stay or get worse because it's an inherently unstable status quo. Can I add something on the last uh, please, issue? Please do, yes. So the, about the how how to deoccupy um, Donbass and Crimea, I absolutely agree with Stephen that it cannot be made by war. 
because well they're, they're, because that's not possible uh, uh we will have a lot of losses all uh, whoever will participate a lot of losses and anyway the russian army is quite big and it won't give any preferences so i don't expect we will lose them but um uh, as 2014 shows then if the nation is resilient it has much more influence on military than just like armed forces and we still are quite resilient and we have a better forces now than before but still uh, it's obviously should be the um, economy uh, diplomatic uh, and increasing of military uh, forces um, as a deterrence fact at the same time, um, the issue which is very important for us and which we sometimes do not now understand the position of uh, partner countries is the values. Because this is not some kind of myth which we have, yes, you know, values which we protect. We do really protect values. Uh, values of um, have, uh, that we have right to be a smaller nation. I mean that if you are smaller nations, it doesn't mean that you uh, has no voice at all, or you can you cannot promote your agenda, or you cannot have your opinion, because the situation which happened here actually describes, like in Georgia, in Moldova before, that if you are a small nation, you cannot well even rely on protection. You should be strong enough, big enough, have a nuclear weapon to protect yourself which like put the huge question mark over the all the world order which we exist and which we build up after the uh, uh second world war this is about the question about the nuclear uh, nuclear neutrality so if uh, those countries who don't have nuclear weapons should they do it and we see how many countries now try to um restore or reinvent the nuclear weapons and how many of them are of dictatorship countries so that gives the example of how you can behave if you have the weapon and that examples can just kill again the whole order in the world and they are killing because the more and more chaos we see in all these uh, like uh, relations between the countries and the third one the russians especially like aggressively and openly misuse the international law they misuse it in uh, like a maritime law they stop the normal economic operations they like uh, find any gaps and like a tick there and if there won't be proper reaction at at, at this uh, like a science or at these actions then again, we come to a very chaotic, uh, chaotic organization of international relation and losing of possibility of normal trade, prognosed, uh, I don't know, movement of people. Uh, you need to invest more and more in your armed forces. So that's like a change the real life of all of us. Uh, for example, I, 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 I don't know, the uh, Baltic countries, they perfectly understand that they won't uh, stay for long, for example, against Russia. And we, if we're saying about the open military aggression, that one issue, but if we're saying about the cyber attacks, what happening now in UK? Are you sure this is just like a problem with provider? I'm not sure. Uh, what happened before in US when uh, the private companies who has like a um, uh, very big importance for the economy structure were attacked and actually they paid to Russians millions for uh, being released from cyber attacks. So this all the bad behavior, if you are not stopping bad behavior and if you are not reinventing the rules which should be kept or reinventing the approaches how you can deter from bad behavior, that will just like uh, obviously hit any country, not on the Ukraine. So this is not the issue about releasing Ukrainian or even restoring the uh, 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 integrity of Ukraine. This is issue about the keeping the rules. If all violate the rules, then we don't have order at all. That's it. Thank you very much, Alina. Um, my Chatham House colleague, James Scher, has been waiting patiently. I think, James, you're probably speaking from Tallinn today, but please. I am. Um, thank you very much. Um, you've not cheered me up, but you've reinforced my 
confidence that the confidence in my own depression and the the, the sound basis <laughs> for it. The, uh, look, the most disturbing and alarming thing that was said by either of you was by Alina at the beginning, that in her first discussion of these issues at NATO, she was surprised by the level of ignorance about this. Now, the fact of the matter has been that since the Montreux Convention of 1936, there has been an international legal order governing the Black Sea, and that has been reinforced by the, inter by the UN Law of the Sea Convention of 1982. And whilst Russia officially doesn't challenge any of this, it holds it up as sacred, it has been doing systematically everything in its power to undermine all of this de facto and transform itself de facto into the arbiter of everything that takes place in the Black Sea and turn the Black Sea de facto into a unipolar, uh, into a unipolar setup. My colleague and yours, Duncan James Nixie, has asked a, 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 a brilliant question that follows directly from this, and I'm going to half poach it. <laughs> the fact that the West is the West, and it, 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 when it, all these areas are increasingly notional and uh, feeble and congenitally divided. What does the one player here that really matters, namely the United States, do realistically? to start to change the mood and dynamic. If you were either of you meeting with Secretary Blinken or with Lloyd Austin, they would say, great, I accept your analysis of the problem. What do you want us to do? And with whom? You didn't mention, you mentioned Turkey, but you know, I think Romania should be brought into the discussion either also. And just you know, one specific question, would it be constructive for the United States publicly to say, we wish to explore the possibility, which we will support, of raising the uh, southeastern flank of NATO to the same status that now exists in the northeastern flank, that is to say, from uh, an enhanced tailored presence to an enhanced forward presence uh, uh, of NATO. And we are willing to resource it. We are willing to, to take steps to make Russia understand there is not just a financial cost to be considered, but a geostrategic cost to be considered. Sorry for being long-winded and to James Nixie for poaching a uh, part of his question. St Stephen, okay. do you want to do you want to have a crack at uh, in, the, uh, in the immediate okay. in response to Definitely. James? Uh, there are a lot of questions here. So James, first of all, uh, I, I have found that Beethoven is a response to depression. It works. And since you're a kindred spirit here, that, that play some. Uh, now, uh, uh, and it, it always helps to be confident in your depression as well. Now, as, as far as the uh, practical response to your questions, if I was talking to Lloyd Austin, I would tell him uh, that the re what needs to be done in the Black Sea area with Romania, and you're quite right, but with everybody else in NATO who is willing to contribute as well, is to do the kinds of things that General Ben Hodges has talked about in his publications. Uh, I, I refer people to these. He, uh, he's written them for the Center for European Policy Analysis, CEPA.org. They're quite uh, substantial um, man, uh, monographs. Set up a command headquarters, command and control headquarters, air defense, uh, conventional uh, air uh, bases as well, excuse me, as well, to the extent that we can get naval forces into the Black Sea on a more permanent basis and rotational, as provided for under the mantra. Uh, NATO does not use the full complement of days that it has to do this. There needs to be a per more permanent rotating force in the Black Sea. Uh, in other words, to strengthen conventional deterrence, backed up by, of course, Article 5 and uh, all the other issues. So at the military level, that is what we ought to be doing. And there's a whole range of suggestions there that need to be followed. Uh, as far as Secretary Blinken goes, I would say what needs to be done is to support 
One, the cre- that they made a terrible mistake with Nord Stream 2, and they have to find alternatives to Russian energy, and I have s- stated some of the ideas that could be done here uh, to bring Western energy into Europe. At the same time, as you keep the pressure on and support for Ukraine, pressure to reform and support for defense and democratization of Ukraine. We cannot allow things like the uh, firing of the leadership of Naftagaz and this kind of uh, uh, back and forth in Ukrainian politics. Uh, Apparently that really angered the White House quite a bit. Uh, Ukraine, you know, if Ukraine wants to be enjoying Western support, it's going to have to strengthen its own domestic capabilities instead of just simply relying on the West. And the other thing I would say to Blinken is you need to have a f- policy in the Caucasus that involves the United States with Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, and that therefore helps bring in NATO and the European Union to strengthen those states and deal with problems like Nagorno-Karabakh so that Russia does not have a monopoly of the action there. The third thing, and that's the end, uh, the dialogue with Turkey needs to go forward, which means that we have to find the basis for working with Turkey. Uh, I think that the Turkish relationship with Russia is more fraught, as I said, than uh, people realize. For example, in the last two to three years, the Turks have steadfastly cut the amount of gas they import from Russia by very serious amounts. And uh, that's a sign that they don't want to be dependent on Russia. The Ukraine is another example. Caucasus is a third. Uh, If we can help resolve issues like the S-400, which I think is important, but perhaps overblown, and uh, get the Greco-Turkish negotiations on the Eastern Mediterranean moving forward, I think there's a basis there for a dialogue with Turkey. But uh, we cannot afford mistakes like Nord Stream 2 or the Ukrainians backsliding on uh, uh, Naftagaz. And also we have to, more politically, we have to call out countries like Bulgaria when they behave the way I've described and, and, and you know, and put some pressure on them to, because their security is very much at stake here as well. I hope that answers your questions. If I, if I may, uh, we have also the question in the chat about the, what Ukraine can bring to NATO. I mean, that what, what we can share. So this is the one of the issues which I, I absolutely agree with Stephen about the, let's say, homework of Ukraine, which needs to be done with reforms, with more predictable policy. Um, we also, believe me, we also suffer from this maybe more than, <laughs> more than even our partners. And um, we try from our from civil society, uh, from expert side to stabilize somehow this, providing the advices and giving the, some kind of other view on situation which happening. Uh, at the same time, I do believe that uh, we, um, in 2014, Ukraine clearly understood already that hope cannot be a part of the strategy. I mean, that you can hope that you will be assisted, uh, but you need to rely on yourself. And this is actually the strategy which worked. We appreciate so much any assistance of our uh, partners, our partner states. Uh, But um, Ukraine managed to um, deter huge Russian forces in the first years by itself. And I think that this is a very strong, um, um, let's say, power which can be brought to the European security. Uh, of course, we can share with the, uh, we have this war um, which no one faces on, the, on their territory, I mean, from democratic states. When you have the war in the cities, uh, positional war, uh, very hybrid war, really, with all the manners and all the domains uh, involved in this. So this is the really unique experience. And we each month, we see how the tactics change. So like uh, if uh, like one, one and a half year ago, for example, drone war was uh, like a first we faced first time when uh, with small drone with the cost of like $50, you can uh, deliver some kind of uh, blowing into the uh, Ukrainian troops and kill seven people immediately. 
So it was like a testing manner for Russians. For now, we have a sniper war, which continues for half a year, even more. Uh, and anti-snipers uh, systems are still not working good. And so this is like a, some, somehow we are, unfortunately, some kind of playground for new war, new methods of war which happening. And this is unique knowledge, uh, which we also know, talking to the, all the trainers from uh, US Army, from Canadian, from UK Army, we know how much they do appreciate possibility to learn this experience, to understand and to uh, develop their capabilities much, uh, much faster. Uh, we have uh, CIMIC operations, which are like, a, I would say, perfectly done in, in Ukrainian territories. And the CIMIC forces, civil military cooperation forces, are here of unique quality. So there are a lot of like a military component which we can bring to Europe. But uh, I think that we also can bring a lot of... Um, let's say consideration, again, coming back to values, uh, values keeping uh, eye uh, to, to all the discussions. Uh, because let's look now what's happening in Belarusia. We, for many, many years, Europe was trying to negotiate with uh, Lukashenko. Yes, sometimes it seems that he's moving to the right direction, that there are more democracies, that there are more business. Uh, but uh, principally, this is our different approaches to uh, uh, state management, state ruling, let's say so, and uh, uh, democracy, and in critical situation in plate. And from now on, we see how the Lukashenko is killing people, uh, showing this on, on air on uh, national TV, and we cannot do, like collectively, we cannot do anything with this because this situation, we allow this situation to be. So uh, this is uh, the very uh, like a urgent situation when we need to understand that any actions which doesn't seem to have direct um, impact now will have an impact in the future. And this knowledge and this urgent feeling, this is maybe the biggest Ukrainian uh, effort which we can make to, to make Europe safely and to make us safety because we feel with our blood and with our like a fingers um, how it is if you neglect some principal stuff in your life so um maybe this is some kind of you know uh, sophisticated but i think that it's uh, very uh, for us it became very real and we want to uh, really protect europe from this this can be our input Thank you very much indeed, Alina. Um, and thank you also for, in effect, taking over from me while, I, while my video was frozen out. So um, I apologize for my temporary absence, everybody. Um, I'm gonna com combine two questions that have come in, one from Janet Gunn and one from Craig Oliphant, both incidentally former colleagues of mine in Foreign Office Research Analysts, who, who um, have raised again the question of Turkey and Turkey's role uh, but also the, the question of Turkey's role in the context of the Turkey-Russia relationship, which I've always found to be a particularly intri intriguing subject, multi-layered, compartmentalized. Um, and there are questions there about the sustainability of the current Turkey-Russia relationship. So perhaps, Stephen, do you have any thoughts about how Turkey might perhaps contribute to the kind of strategy you've announced, bearing in mind that Turkey also has a, a very quite a com its own complicated bilateral relationship with Russia. Uh, first of all, th uh, it's great to hear from you, Janet. It's been a long time. Uh, as for Turkey, I'm not an expert on Turkey, but I mean, it, I think it should be clear that Turkey is already contributing to this by by its defense agreements with with uh, Kiev, with the Ukraine, uh, the, transferring these uh, very lethal drones. Uh, technology for building them and, and also uh, Corvettes uh, indicates, uh, as the Turkish government said, that the integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and the security of the Black Sea are matters of, quote, principle. That, that's not something you often hear, certainly from a government like Erdogan's. Uh, 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 so there's already a basis for collaboration. Practical matter, for example, we could try to resurrect the idea that was brooded about about five years ago 
for a Black Sea Maritime Patrol, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey. Uh, there's going to be a new government in Bulgaria. When that government comes in, that would be something worth investigating if it could be set up. Furthermore, dialogue with Turkey. Key issues with Turkey need to be resolved. The S-400 issue needs to be resolved. Um, there are negotiations on the way. I, that much is clear. I don't know what the state of those is. And there's certainly going to be contact between, let's say, the American and Turkish governments at the NATO meetings, because, you know, both both leaders will be there. Uh, and you need to get that issue off the table, both in terms of uh, European energy security and Black Sea security in general. You need to get the Greek-Turkish issue in the Eastern Mediterranean into a negotiation that lends, leads to a resolution. That could also lead to perhaps a resolution of the Cyprus issue, which would ameliorate Turkey's tensions with not only with Greece, but with France. That would also create the basis for a better relationship among allies in Europe. So uh, finally, as well, I think it was a great mistake by the European Union 17 years ago, I wrote it then, to give up on the negotiations with Turkey. I think a lot of the problems we have come back to that. I really think Turkey needs to be brought into the, some form of permanent association with the European Union, if not membership. Uh, I know all the arguments against that or, and for it, but at the end of the day, Turkey is a vital player in European security and in the agenda that the European Union wants to deal with. And it can't deal with those issues unless Turkey is in some formal association with it, the details of which they need to be worked out in negotiation. Uh, I, I can't be more specific because this is something beyond uh, my expertise and involves all kinds of technical economic as well as uh, governance issues. But I think, uh, I think the need for a working relationship between the EU and, and Turkey, as well as resolution of these issues is paramount. Same thing, the United States needs to get into the Caucasus. U European Union needs to get into the Caucasus in a bigger way as well. And we have to stop telling Georgia, yes, you're going to be in NATO someday, but not during my lifetime. Uh, this is not going to play in Georgia. It already has encountered a lot of suspicion and we're in danger of Georgia regressing considerably from where we had thought it, we, Georgia had, had gotten. Um, Russia, of course, would be mortified if Georgia were to become a member of NATO. But at the end of the day, if we had strong Western leadership, we could give them the answer is you brought this on yourself. So that's some of the answers I would give Janet. I'm going to come to Arisia in a moment. But first of all, I'd just quickly like to ask Alina this pretty much the same question. I mean, from, from Ukraine's perspective, how in, just how important um, is the uh, uh, the relationship with Turkey, Turkey in terms of addressing some of the really serious security issues that you mentioned in your presentation? Well, actually, the Turkey uh, Turkey is one of the main players in the Black Sea. Let's say uh, the only player who can balance Russia in some way. Plus, we have additional component that uh, we have a huge diaspora of Crimean Tatars in Turkey, which is our non very effectively used uh, before force. So, and this uh, gives us like a additional uh, value for our relations. We should just understand that the um, uh, Turkey, uh, let's say traditions and culture uh, is different a little bit from like a general European culture. And their a way of diplomacy is a little bit different and we need to find this approach. I think that the, probably Turkey is the one of the examples where Ukraine is managing not so bad for the last periods. So because we started to uh, communicate with them on military issues like uh, two years ago and it started to move forward. Uh, then uh, this is some kind of economic issues with the exchange of technologies and that started to play well. Now we have very strong connections of the government due to the presence of the Crimean Tatar representatives in the government. 
with the uh, Turkish counterparts. So it starts to move up. And I think that the position which Turkey demonstrates now on the Crimea, it's also the result of this work. And I do believe that uh, though uh, Turkey will always have this, like uh, their mind uh, on the diplomacy and their mind on their relations with uh, uh, Russia, we can uh, make regional or some specific topic coalitions with them, uh, which will also emphasize and increase the partnership of, uh, within NATO. Because let's say openly that uh, NATO-Turkey relations are also quite complicated. Although Turkey is a part of NATO, but still there are a lot of like uh, uh, nuances and misunderstanding there. And I think that the some kind of uh, uh, joint goals and joint operations and joint approaches in, for example, Black Sea stabilization uh, can bring more clearness on the table. So I think that the Turkey need to be like a specifically um, considered and involved in all the issues uh, around the Black Sea and wider security issues. Thank you very much indeed, Alina. Um, Arisia. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you, Alina and Stephen, for bringing us, you know, on this journey around the security risk in the Black Sea region. I think it's it's important that we keep the focus not only today, but as you know, Alina pointed over the summer all the way to October and future uh, on the region. So um, um, please do follow, I think, and we will try to follow as well. You know, just a comment as we were discussing Turkey, there's an interesting recent appointment in the office of the president of Ukraine of the former ambassador to Turkey, who is now deputy head of office of the president, uh, working, will be working with Yermak and hopefully with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs keep carry, carrying on some of these successes that uh, Ukrainian diplomacy managed to achieve with Turkey. So that's an interesting human resource uh, appointment that is quite positive in the recent uh, times. But I have a question on the, um, on the governance side and reform side to Alina, in particular with regards to Ukroboronoprom and Ukraine's defense ministry, uh, industry. Of course, Stephen mentioned Naftogaz and that uh, setback that uh, worried uh, many, including Blinken and many in Ukraine. But for Ukraine's own, you know, uh, resilience and raising the cost for Russian aggression, uh, surely the reform in the defense sector and uh, one of the largest companies such as Ukraine Prom is important because it can unlock. And here I would also would like to, if you can bring in the UK with the new strategic agreement and the uh, foreign export finance opportunities for Ukrainian defense sector to work bilaterally, for example, with the UK, building Ukrainian you know, defense capabilities on the southern flank, on the sea. Um, it, it's a great opportunity, but do you think Ukraine is using it? Do you think there's enough appetite uh, in the UK? Uh, and how do you see this bilateral relationship evolving? Thank you so much, Alina. Yeah, you're absolutely right about the, let's say, Turkish um, presence in, in, in like influence also in, in our personnel management now in, in government. We also have a special advisor to the prime minister uh, who is advising on Turkey. So she's one of the best specialists on Turkey in Ukraine, and she's now like a special advisor to the prime minister. So obviously we see that the Turkey uh, direction becoming very important in Ukraine and in Ukraine politics, which is well. So uh, now about the Okra Prom and the industry itself, that's a very complicated question, let's say so, because for many, many years it didn't move uh, somehow. So we had some achievements like a developed strategy, then it's again freezed. Then we have a change of the management. That's it again freezed. Um, the, for us, uh, the, the, well, actually, without reforming uh, the Ukra Baron Prom and all the enterprises, we won't move anywhere because um, uh, the, we have a very strange uh, um, legal form of organization of all the enterprises. Most of enterprises, they are most of them are non profitable. Most of them has no money to. Um, renew themselves with the equipment uh, to have uh, some kind of innovations. 
uh, because we don't have like a normal research and development fund which can finance we don't have the normal i don't know agency expert agency which can support with low percent uh, with low uh, uh, rates on on, on long-term contracts so there is like a huge number of problems and of course if we want investments we need to like make the transparent structure which is in the process now uh, the last, um, like, a promises which uh, head of Ukrabarantro made, he said that uh, within half a year they will, let's say, uh, let's say, make the first step in uh, formal or legal transformation of uh, the uh, Ukrabarantro, with further um, implementation of already of all this stuff. Um, at the same time, I should tell you that I, um, what is worrying me that I don't see so much support of um, innovations which are made here. And, and this is the huge space because again, coming back to frontline, you can, uh, this is not only the war now of very heavy weapon, this is the war of light technologies which has cheaper, which has like a very short term for um, development and which can be tested immediately on the front line. I mean that you have like a, from this point of view, you have ideal ground for uh, development and testing. And uh, when we were in the ministry, actually we uh, launched this contract. I hope that it will be like a, just the beginning for from UK a huge contract on, on, on more than one billion um, pounds on um, uh, which should be invested into the building of vessels for Navy, Ukrainian Navy and some infrastructure. And the another part which we were discussing with the uh, UK counterparts, it was like, again, the light innovations, which were extremely interesting for the MOD of UK. And I'm sure that it will be interesting for private investors also and for cooperation. I think that the Ukrainian way of developing our industry is to have as much possible joint enterprises or cooperation or joint production. Uh, because uh, Ukraine has a lot of engineering forces and still have a good school in, in, in uh, defense industry, but has less resources with the production. And this is the way how it can go. And we see this with um, uh, vessels building. So the France did the same. So the, the first uh, uh, vessels they uh, sold to the bodyguard, uh, like a, uh, marines or bodyguards. Now they um, make it in France. Now they make a localization of production. So that, that could be countering exchange of uh, uh, all the technologies of ideas and production. But for this, really, the, the first step should be done. And uh, for now on, only the Ukrabaron Prom is in the process of finalizing the, for example, database of uh, all the property rights and intellectual rights, because we didn't have even this one. And the problem, for example, with Motor Siege, uh, which was sold actually untransparent for the government, keeping the like a very sensitive technologies. Um, demonstrating that we can face it like uh, many, many times afterwards. Uh, we are moving not so fast as uh, I would like to, uh, but I would say that now the industry issue is all the time on the top of discussions. The president not so long ago said that the Anton of renovation and rebirth is the like some kind of presidential project. So it would be under the wider focus of the um, all the authorities. I hope that it will, will make the move forward. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. Thank you very much, Alina. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, we will have to finish fairly sharply at, at, at 2.30. I have one question which I, I, I um, uh, inadvertently overlooked. Uh, and I think Stephen has already touched on this, but I've, I think it's a, an issue worth revisiting. It's from Sean Oliver D, who asks, how reassuring was James Apathurai's assurance of NATO support for Georgian security given last year in respect of broader NATO commitment to Black Sea security? Well, Stephen, have you anything more to add on this? Yeah, let me add. I mean, um, it's not enough just for somebody in a prominent position like Mr. Apathurai to come and say, yes, you know, we support you and so on. I mean, this has to, 
this is the kind of relationship where you have to actually say uh, it's, uh, you know, do you every morning or so? I mean, it's like a husband or a wife or two lovers where one says, do you still love me? I mean, uh, uh, these countries need to be reassured. Uh, Sir Michael Howard, you know, 40 years ago wrote that the key princ goals of uh, purposes of NATO were deterrence and reassurance. And if you're not deterring, and if you're not reassuring, you're not doing the other one. Um, it's there has to be a real policy, which means coordinated actions with a purpose in mind that lead to this. Um, the whole point is that Russia should not have a veto on Georgia uh, entering NATO. I don't believe in gratuitous provocations, but only in Moscow do people believe that being a member of NATO is inherently a threat to Russia. That's because Russia regards anybody's efforts at self-defense as inherently threatening. But the fact of the matter is that Ukraine and Georgia and everybody else east of the Elba, even in west of the Elba, ought to understand that there are good reasons why governments are afraid of Russia and want the security of NATO. And the Russians can scream and, and, and so forth, but at the end of the day, uh, they, the fact that NATO is in Eastern Europe means that they're secure to a degree that they never were before. Uh, the absence of NATO and a return to spheres of influence or nationalization of security, as the Vogue term puts it, is not a guarantee of Russia's security, quite the opposite. And it does not, I mean, this needs to be explained in the face of overwhelming propaganda, but it's the truth. It's what 900 years of European history tell us. And uh, we need to make that point. And we need to make it to Georgia and Ukraine, not just simply where somebody parachutes in once every six months and says, we love you and we want you in NATO, but that actual constructive action is taking place. Can I add something? Please no? do, Elena. Um, as we know, the NATO is now developing the NATO strategy for 2030. So, and the issue is that um, there should be obviously some part on the Black Sea security. Because if we won't see it, it will mean again that this is very short seen uh, strategy, which is not going to be truth in any uh, like a nearest future. So um, we made a lot of attempts and a lot of efforts put to, to uh, develop recommendation and pass them to NATO. We hope that the uh, NATO uh, like management and NATO leadership will take it into account. And this is, I, I see as a, like a still a window of opportunity to press uh, on the governments and to push them to, to have some kind of position on this regard. Um, the presence of NATO in the Black Sea can be not only with like huge, uh, I don't know, uh, vessels. Uh, last escalation, you see that um, the petrol boats came from UK, just like a few from UK, uh, one from UK, one from US. And what they were doing, they were just like a pathing between the gas uh, stations, which uh, Russia occupied from Russia, uh, from Ukraine. They were passing through it, uh, demonstrating the, that they are able to uh, protect the freedom of navigation. And you know, Russian just were not reacting. Although before, when Ukraine did it by itself, we were under shooting, we were under threats. And so this is the principle of the like a collective defense. When you not just put like a lot of weapons, but you make an actions which can be now, not specifically military force, uh, yeah, but which demonstrate that still the collective power has the presence, collective power has the influence. And I think that um, Georgia obviously is like a well prepared to be a, a member of NATO. They are completely ready. I know what I'm talking about because I was just observing their army transformation for many years. They're completely ready. They sent enormous number of people to Afghanistan to join mission, like 800 people for Georgia. This is like a huge amount. So they are like uh, demonstrating a lot of will, preparedness and readiness to join. And I think that it's uh, very fair to support it and it will bring more uh, security to NATO countries also. Because finally, probably it will broke up the legend that um, not moving to closer to Russia, you uh, 
give some, I don't know, like a more stability. Now, the less uh, countries are your partners, uh, the more instability you have with NATO and European countries. Um, so that's like some kind of comment on it. Thank you again, Alina. Um, we have five minutes left. I, I don't see any more questions either in the chat or in the raised hand. So I'm going to revert to both Steve and Alina for, for any final comments and thoughts they have. But I'd like to um, conclude just by returning to a question that we, we have already addressed. It was really the question that James Scher re raised, partly um, drawing on James Nix's question about prioritization uh, and focus in terms of the the array of challenges and the array of issues that face policymakers, Western policymakers, when they try to grasp um, the, 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 the issue of Black Sea security in the context of Russian militarization of the region. I guess so just by way of trying to push you a little bit further on this on this question of prioritization, are, is there one or maximum two issues here? that Western policymakers need to focus on in terms of thinking about the practical support, the practical action that they take in order to advance Western interests and defend and promote Western interests in the region? Are there, are there one, maximum two issues they need to focus on out of the array of issues we've covered? So that's my question, just to wrap up with. But any other thoughts you have about issues that we've covered, please. Um, and maybe we'll start with Stephen. Two, prior <clears throat> two priorities, as you said, um, for the West. One for Ukraine. The one for Ukraine is very obvious. The Ukrainian government has to take a determined effort to break through the obstacles to reform. That will open up much more support, not just Western, but w global, uh, economic in, in that sense as well. And, and that includes also in energy and in, and in defense, as Alina has talked about. But for the West, the two priorities are, one, strengthening conventional deterrence, as we have talked about. And as uh, people like General Hodges have written about in the Black Sea area. And second, restoring a dialogue that leads to unity of purpose with Turkey. I, I, I don't want to double Stephen with the, um, uh, with, uh, the with specific points. So I would say that um, we need to understand that in this occupation and this war puts a lot of like questions and the world will be not the same like before. And we cannot approach the solving of issues and building up the future with the rules or uh, like a behavior which we had before. So unfortunately, the uh, whole world need to invent new rules, invent new approaches. We will deal, believe me, with very complicated questions while the occupation, I just today, read the close research which was made in Crimea, uh, which uh, demonstrates that uh, at least 37% of population, this is the newly um, arrived population from Russia to Crimea. So we, in, in the moment when we have a deoccupation, we will have just like a, a huge number of people, for example, who consider themselves to be a Crimean, but they are not. And what we should do with this, shall we approach with typical uh, human, um, I don't know, human uh, protection or right of human rights protection approach to these people. How should we behave? So this is the complex question. There are the complex questions and we need to start to deal with maritime laws and security, with some other laws and security, with informational occupation, uh, with hybrid war. This is all new, which we need to uh, respond because otherwise we won't build up some kind of more stable uh, future. And this is, of course, this is first of all task for leading forces in this, uh, in Europe and US. And the second, second probably it's just like finally uh, for in their strategy and their behavior and their planning for um, European politics, I would say stop to believe that you can negotiate with dictatorship regimes. I mean that you perfectly understand that the China behave uh, in other way and you build up your strategies understanding that China will never behave in the same way like, uh, I don't know, European democracies are. 
stop to take Russia as a European, possibly European democratic country. They are different. Start to build up your strategies from the point that they are different. And they behave in different way, and they plan in different way, and they react in different way. I think it would be much easier for all the European countries to prognose the relations and to build up the relations and to build up the strategies if you will just understand that Russia will never be uh, similar to European countries in their behavior, unfortunately, for us. <laughs> so that's probably two issues I would like to mention. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Delina. Um, we're going to have to end on that sobering note, which certainly concentrates the mind. Um, we're, we're particularly grateful to you and Stephen because we've worked you pretty hard this afternoon. Um, there have been two members of the panel, not three. Um, I'm full of admiration for the way in which you've really covered all the issues that have been thrown at you, and you've dealt dealt with the issues. Um, very, very openly, very freely. Um, and it's been, I think, tremendously beneficial for all of us, in not, not just in terms of the coverage that we've got, but also the depth also that we've managed to dig into in, in a number of areas. So thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you more generally to everybody who took time out to take part in today's event and who contributed to the discussion. Um, we hope that you... Um, found it found it worthwhile and positive i'm sure you did um, and just to say again that there will be a recording of today's event that will be appearing presently on the on the chatham house website so once again thank you to alina and stephen thank you to everybody else for taking part and enjoy the rest of your day bye-bye